All right. Uh, welcome to the next chapter of Web APIs with R. Uh, today, we're going to try to talk about how do I tell the API who I am. Um, I promised on Slack I was going to make a slide about uh, rec cache, and then I completely forgot to do that and just remembered it when I started to set things up here. Um, so we'll talk about that uh, somewhere in some time. Mostly, I don't have much to add other than what's in the, the help, but um, it looks worth doing most of the time. And so I want to try to work out some um, guidelines to try to advise when and how to do that. Um, it just, it stops you from doing the same requests. If you've, you know, if you've already done exactly the same request, it won't do it again. Um, and that's a good kind of good citizenship thing to do. So I will add a slide about that and we'll go over it when I do. All right. So, uh, how do I tell the API who I am? So uh, what we're trying to learn today is we want to learn how to identify yourself with a user agent. Um, we want to find authentication information in API docs. And then we want to authenticate a request with an API key. And all important, we want to authenticate a request with OAuth. Uh, we might touch on the OAuth stuff today, but I don't have those slides completely done. That is definitely the hardest part of all this. Um, I do want to just, you know, reassure you that it is, um, almost intentionally confusing. It's intentionally co complex, which makes it confusing and don't feel bad if you find it confusing because it is confusing, um, that there are many articles about why is OAuth still hard, um, and it took a long time for me to understand. I still don't 100% understand all of the reasons behind some of the steps, but um, we'll talk about that a little, actually quite a bit of why, why it's as compli complicated as it is. I wanted to point out uh, in this club, things that I don't plan to cover. Um, I'm not gonna do rec auth basic because it's, like very barely ever used where you actually enter a username and password as part of the call. And if you do need to use it, you just do it. Like it's not, there's not a lot to it. I'll explain why you shouldn't, like why APIs shouldn't be designed that way. Um, but we won't go into uh, details of how to use it. There's also a fairly new cookie mechanism built into Hitter2. I don't plan to go into that in detail. Um, I don't plan to go into rec options yet, mostly because I haven't had time to play with some of these weird cases of how to off using that. Um, it is possible to do some more complicated things that way, but again, I haven't had a use case for it. So once I have a use case, either I'll add it as an on online supplement in the book or possibly put it into the book, but so far not, I haven't had a reason. And I'm not going over rec proxy um, because again, it kind of is what it says. Like if you need to use a proxy, follow the instructions in the in the function. Um, and I just wanted to bring those up in case anything there like really stands out. Please let me know if those are things like, oh, I absolutely expected you to cover that. So um, just to point those out. All right. So the first thing that we said we wanted to figure out how to do is uh, use a user agent to be, I don't think I said it before, but we will want to use it to be polite. And I'll explain what that means. So first off, what the heck's a user agent? Um, the user agent, technically speaking, and this is like in quotes user agent, is software that accesses the web. And it's arguable whether your code is the user, user agent or like hitter two and R and the things that hitter two is using, if those are the user agent. Um, if you're writing a package, you probably will want to identify that people are using your package so that if you're screwing something up and it's showing up a lot, the API can tell you about it. And that's, I guess, to back up a little bit, that's, that's why this exists is so that people can, or so that you and the API have a way to communicate if something is weird. Um, so separate from the concept of a user agent, there is a header that you can put onto your requests 
that is formerly user hyphen agent. And that's a string that identifies who the user agent is. Um, hitter two automatically defaults or attaches a default user agent. And I'm gonna show that right here, that if you just do like rec dry run, or if you actually run a basic request from hitter, uh, hitter two, um, it puts in this user agent line. And so it says, you know, hitter two version 1.01, R curl version 5.21 and lib curl version 8.3.0. That is showing kind of the general format of a user agent is it tends to be like thing slash version version. Um, but most of the time that default thing, that's fine. You can leave that. Uh, but if you write a package, it's good to include some information about that in the user agent so that um, like I said, so they can uh, communicate with you. And uh, there might be specific documentation that tells you what to do in user agent. Like uh, Jim found in the Crossref documentation, they tell you, hey, please include an email address in your user agent so we can contact you if something goes wrong. And if you do that, you automatically go into a, uh, like, um, a faster pool in the API. And so it is worth looking through and seeing like um, after that, I started just searching for agent after he uh, pointed that out is look for agent in docs because uh, it might be worthwhile. You know, they might do something with that. That's why I included this in this chapter about auth because it's kind of like um, the most basic level of auth of if the API doesn't set anything up, you can still tell the API who you are and that way, if something is weird and they see it in their logs, they can contact you and tell you that something is weird. Now, obviously, with this user agent, they can't really do much with that. And so uh, you'll want to set your own user agent. So hitter2 has this rec user agent function. If you just leave it as null, it will, which is, is by default, it will just attach um, this user agent. Um, But, and it, it's still like, if you leave it as null, it won't attach anything. And then when you actually perform the request, it'll attach the user agent by default. Um, but you can put in your own thing. And then the standard is you put parentheses with some more details, uh, separating all those more details pieces with semicolons. Um, yeah, and so on the next slide, I have a little bit more about that. Um, Yeah, and so yeah, they need contact information according to, um, as we can see in the chat. So a thing that I am just barely experimenting with, so I, I threw this into my R profile so that I have these functions and can use them um, whenever I'm making a request to kind of play around with things. Uh, just I, I start these with a period because that way they don't show up in our studio under your environment, like they're invisible things that you have uh, defined. And that way I can just kind of have them there to play with if I need them. Um, nothing runs by default, but it, it'll exist. And, and again, I'm just experimenting with this. I don't know if I like it yet. Um, so we'll see if this makes it into the next version of these slides. Uh, so this first part is just uh, basically copy pasted code out of what hitter two is doing by default. It looks up these versions of the uh, pieces that it cares about and I paste those together so that it'll have, um, you know, this string. So that's that's all that is doing here. This hitter two UA, and then I have I, I pulled out me and the URL that I want to give it, the email address that I want to give it, so that people can easily copy paste and modify this code. And it will put the hitter two string, and then my name, this URL that I'm sending it, and mail to my email address. Um. I don't know yet, <laughs> again, if I'm actually going to use this, but it feels like a good thing. Like I was trying to find a way to set a default user agent with hitter two, and right now that isn't possible. Um, I might suggest it because just if you're doing a lot of calls to random APIs, um, I mean, on the one hand, you know, you might like not want to tell them who you are, but I think it's pretty good. You know, it's a good idea 
to let them know or make it possible for them to tell you if you are screwing something up. And so, you know, like in this case with the um, Crossref API, they'll just treat you better just if you have a mail to in your user agent. Um, and so it's worth kind of being a good citizen. All right, any questions, comments on that kind of aside? And, um, um, I guess oh, go ahead. Big, big picture, I'm still a little confused about how, I, I mean, I see the Crossref example and I glanced at that documentation. So that, that's a neat use case for it, but how often <laughs> do you think APIs have any intention of reaching out to users versus just setting whatever limits? Uh, like if you are using uh, smaller APIs or, or, you know, like government APIs where it's likely to be um, someone who is also making the API, it's like not their primary job. I actually think you're more likely to get good benefit out of this um, because it gives them something they can see in the logs. And I don't think they're likely to like automatically do something bad to you based on this. Um, they're going to do well, that just based more on your. The other, the yeah. other flip side, not of how many APIs do you think they have someone semi manually, or maybe it's not manual, but still they set up something to email users response versus just setting what other, other, other ways they can. So set, right, if thing. you do accidentally, like, you know, I've used the APIs that um, I don't know if it's just like, some guy has this running on a machine at home or, you know, his, I, I'm going to blow up his Amazon account or something. And so I, it's good to have that there okay. in case they do. I, I like the idea of it. Like I said, I hadn't really thought of this before. Um, I, I have user agents built into the um, packages I've built, but now I kind of want to rethink that and, you know, let people maybe, um, override that or put their own information in or something, because I think it's an interesting thought. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know yet. Like I, I want to start kind of gathering, but part of it is you won't know unless something goes wrong. <laughs> um, in most cases, it won't probably won't do anything. And that's why I would really like it if it could just be, uh, you know, you set an option and it just does this um, because in a lot of cases, it would just, it would be nice. No. And that's the reason that most of the time, you know, like hitter two just is sending information about itself is chances are it's not you screwing or actually with hitter two, chances are it is you screwing up. But if it's like a package, it's probably the package screwing up, not you screwing up. Um, and so it makes sense in that case for the package author to get the contact. Um, but it would still be nice to be able to track it down the next step of, oh, wow, who is doing that with my package? Um, so it's an interesting thought and I haven't really absorbed it yet. Um, so the uh, to respond to what you have in chat there, Jim, the URL query is likely to break things because you're adding a query parameter. I mean, a lot of times parameters they don't use are just ignored, but um, I wouldn't do that most of the time. Um, sending in a parameter, you're basically sending it to the function that you're calling. Um, okay, and if Crossref does that, okay, just make sure you follow what they want. Um, but I think setting up the user agent should be kind of your default way to go. And <laughs> All right. So now on to the kind of the main topic. So I want to talk about authentication. And you know, before we dive into the how-tos, I want to try to understand like why is this complicated? Um, what why are all these different schemes or why do they exist and why do you need to worry about them? And the first thing you'll find if you go digging around about this on the internet is uh, people will very carefully point out that that, that auth actually means two different things. Uh, technically, there's authentication and 
auth also sometimes means authorization. So authentication is about like verifying who you are. It uses some sort of credentials and it's, you know, it's your way of saying, like this chapter is uh, titled, it's about telling the API who you are. Versus authorization is technically granting access to API endpoints, different things like that. So they're, they're not quite the same thing. Um, but both are usually abbreviated auth. Um, and, you know, it kind of tellingly, uh, hitter two has rec auth, which kind of sometimes means authentication and sometimes means authorization. Um, and they're, they are often used interchangeably. So despite people making a big deal about, oh, these are different things. Yeah, they're different things, but like this is from the Mozilla, Mozilla Developer Network documentation about the uh, authorization request header. And in the definition of the authorization request header, they uh, tell you that it's used to provide credentials that authenticate a user. Um, so it's it's a big mix. Uh, so yes, you will see this and it is good to know that it is technically two things, but really these two things get wrapped, sorry, these two things get wrapped into one thing in a lot of people's minds. Um, Interestingly, interestingly, when I was trying to find, like, are these really used to mean different things? Um, I found out that servers are supposed to send a response. If you don't authenticate or if you authenticate wrong, there's a www authenticate header that they're supposed to send back that tells you how to authenticate. And man, it just made me sad to find out that that's how it's supposed to work because I have not found anything that does that. That would make life so much easier if you could just send a test response or test request and it would tell you what to do. Um, so if you're building APIs, and I, I'm probably gonna put that into the second half when we start working with Plumber, uh, do that, that sounds great. <laughs> so, all right. All right, so, okay, that's the difference. And we said authentication uh, involved credentials. So what's the big deal? What can happen if you have leaky credential credentials? And really like, this is, I mean, we know what can happen. We, or we, you know, you might have thoughts about like, you know, your account could get hacked or uh, different data could leak out. All there, these different things can happen. And how to assess how dangerous that is. Um, you need to look at like, how much control does that credential give? Uh, can it lock you out? Can it reveal sensitive information? Uh, the next piece that tells you like, how dangerous is it for a credential to leak? is how long does it last? Uh, the shorter that the credential lasts, the, the safer it is, uh, just because if someone steals it, they need to use it at that moment or you know before it expires. And can you revoke it? If you can revoke a credential, if you can delete it, basically turn it off, make it not valid anymore, then it's less dangerous for it to go away or for it to, get, to leak. And then of course, how likely is it to leak? Like When do you send it? Uh, where do you send it? Do you send it like, can it only go to a specific server or can it uh, go into uh, different places? Uh, how often do you send it? I wanted to point these out because these rules or these these thinking about these, these are why basically OAuth, the, the complicated auth system that we're going to get to eventually, why it exists is to try to like minimize these. And so you have some different types of authentication. authentication. Um, I'm gonna go over, um, I say three in my notes, but I think I'm going over four <laughs> types of authentication, kind of broad categories. The most dangerous, I'm um, looking at that um, matrix of, of danger is this HTTP basic authorization where you have username and password sent with each request. Like I said, I'm not going to kind of go into details about how to do this because it's a bad idea most of the time and very few APIs use it. Um, because if you're sending a username and a password, that is you, like they can access your entire account. Um, it's often difficult to turn that off or, you know, like if someone takes it, they can lock you out and you can't do anything about it. Um, you might be able to like talk to someone and, uh, get them to reset your account or something, but then you would have to be able to prove that you were you. So that's bad. That's really dangerous. That has all the bad things associated with it from the previous slide. Um, 
Next level up that we will see a lot is an API key where you have a password-like thing that you send with each request. Um, it is like unique to you usually, sorry. And usually you only have one key. So um, if someone is using it, they are basically being you. But a lot of times you can turn off that key and then basically anything that is using that key won't work anymore. So that makes it better than a password. And importantly, like you don't lose control of your account if they get your uh, API key most of the time. You just need to get rid of that key. The next level up, um, which is really close to an API key, it's kind of like a type of API key, uh, it's bearer tokens. And the idea of a bearer token is that uh, you have a different token for each like um, use case. Uh, the token itself is supposed to be short-lived. It isn't always, but it's supposed to be. And, and I um, don't have a bullet for it, but the token, like each token have can have different permissions. So you can have a token that does have all the permissions to like edit your account, but you know, ideally don't use that for everything. You can have a different token that just has uh, a smaller subset of permissions. And then kind of the, the top of these four that I'm talking about is OAuth. Uh, it's a multi-step process to generate a key. Um, and it exists to minimize all the dangers that we talked about. It has multiple short-lived pieces. And so um, it like stop, you know, if someone intercepts part of it, they can't do anything. They haven't really uh, gotten your key. Um, and it's, it's just, it is, as complicated as it is because of all those dangers. It's like, this is what everyone has come up with as one of the best ways to deal with all these issues. Um, but sometimes OAuth isn't implemented correctly. Um, so it, in those cases, it doesn't necessarily minimize all the issues. Um, for example, I know that uh, Slack, you know, they issue a bearer token that number one, I. You, I think you, I mean, you can have one per app, basically, and uh, it lasts forever. And so, okay, I went through this big dance, and now I have a key that's just as leaky as an API key. Um, and so there are different systems that implement things to different uh, levels of usefulness. Um, there are other schemes that are... Um, that exists. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, about it, but you can do API keys in cookies instead of API keys in the query or in a header. Um, you can use SSL uh, cert uh, certificates for authentication. There are all kinds of different things. Um, again, if I find useful use cases uh, for APIs that require them, then I'll integrate them in the next version. But so far, these kind of cover and really, uh, this and this covers pretty much everything. Bearer token is kind of included inside of OAuth in most cases. All right. And yeah, I will need, there will need to be a picture. Uh, all right. So how can I find authentication information? Um, in order to, to use this, you'll need to find, you know, okay, what does this AP, API want? To me, the, the end all be all is finding the open API scheme, at least not necessarily the end all, but a, an important piece. Um, if you have that open API description of an API, you can find um, security schemes within uh, the components piece of the um, specification or of the description. And that just lays out, these are the ways that you can authenticate with this server. It, it, like defines them in formal language. Uh, they, I mean, they can still do weird things with it, but it, you can follow um, how it's designed. But be careful because there's also a security top level piece of the open API description. And that tells you what the default schemes are. And so, you know, sometimes somewhere down in security schemes, it might say that there's this API key scheme and it tells you what that means. And then at the top level, it will just say, API key. Um, and 
technically they could name that whatever they want. So they might have a scheme that's named OAuth, but if you go look at the security schemes, it's actually an API scheme, something like that. Uh, so um, security schemes is what to look for. We're gonna look at a couple examples here. So my old friend, OpenFEC, and if we just search for security, well, actually let me go back up to that. So if I just search for security, it says these are the default security schemes that you can use, which we'll look at in a second of how crazy that is because they have these three different things. And if we go down to security schemes, we can see there's API key header auth. It says that in the header, you can send something named X API key and it is of the type API key. So cool, that's good to know. We also have this API key query auth that you send in the query. Um, it's a field named API key that you send in the query string. And it is again of type API key. And then finally, there's this third one, which I don't know, it just amuses me. It's named API key. And other than that, it is exactly the same as this one. So really these last two are the same thing. They just gave it two names for whatever reason. I'm sure there's some historical reason of something will break if they delete one of those or more likely they didn't realize that they had both of them there. Um, versus just, uh, and the reason I am switching over to using Google Calendar here is I realized that the uh, OpenFEC has some things that have dates. And so I wanna try to make an app that integrates these um, in the book. And so I'm gonna show how to put them together at some point, um, but this one's much more complicated. We go to security. Um, first off, what we will see is in every endpoint. So it's got you know 38 responses. Uh, they tell us the security that applies to that endpoint, to that path. Um, this is not an uncommon thing that different endpoints might have different security requirements. Um, and so that is something to watch out for. Um, usually in the documentation, it would also say, oh, this one needs to use this security, or you might need a higher level of security to access. You know, usually that's read will, let, will take less security than write. Uh, in a lot of cases. But if we go down to security schemes, we can see uh, is that there are two security schemes. Um, so <laughs> Jim asked in the chat, do you know of a resource, a book, a video, et cetera, that explains the security problems without getting to implementation? I understand the basic ideas first. Um, I do not, and I am trying to either find that or put it together um, because I think there is a lot, like I started reading a book that is about API security, but, or yeah, I think it's about API security, but it really quickly is getting into the implementing your API. I wanted something that was just about security. Like just, just don't get into the code because you, I don't want a book on Java, writing APIs in Java. That's not useful to me. Um, and so, okay, we will have more of those in Slack to talk about. Um, but yeah, talking about the, the ways, the compromises or the ways that things can be compromised there, there is, um, there are some links in that book that I was reading that I will be pulling down and getting some things from, cause there are different things that kind of track what are the, um, the, the dangers that your API has right now. And so. Um, that's a little bit of a side tangent. And actually, we're going to get into that more in the second half of the book when you're actually creating an API, um, because that's where you'll want to make sure you're implementing the level of security that is useful for whatever type of thing you're doing. So more on this in the next half of the book. Um, that is something, by the way, that uh, we'll get a you know, not bad understanding at this point in the book of how security works. but once you actually implement it, um, like that's where we'll really, really hopefully <laughs> get a deep understanding because we're not just going to be using OAuth, we'll be like making OAuth on the other end of the book. Um, but if we look at this Google Calendar, they have two different types of OAuth um, flows. Um, we're not going to go into deep detail about this today, but they have uh, implicit OAuth 2 authentication, this is kind of like the easier, the, um, the, the, the simpler version of OAuth 2 authentication. 
Um, and then they ha also have uh, authorization code authentication, which is what you would see like all the time. Whenever you give something permission to, when you or not permission, but when you log in using Google or you log in using Facebook or log in using Apple ID or all the various things that there is login using, that is using OAuth. Um, and usually it's using the authorization code flow, even though you might not see all of that under the hood. Um, so again, this tells you like authorization URL, scopes and token URL, those are like all of the information you need in order to implement OAuth on your API. So it's really nice that it's there if you know to look for it. Um, but the other place that you often will still need to look because, you know, if you see like neither of these, it tells you how to do it, but it isn't enough yet. Like you don't have enough, you can't actually implement it. It just says these are what it is. Like, how do I get an API key? This doesn't tell you that. It just tells you that you need an API key. And so we are still also going to need the documentation. Um, unfortunately, there's no standard on this. Like people will mention it at the top of the documentation. Some people will mention it deep into each path. Um, some um, We're gonna look a little bit at Google Calendar at how complicated it is, but we're not gonna get into all the details about it just yet. Um, but yeah, if we go over to the OpenFEC documentation, this one pretty quickly um, tells us that, you know, we can, um, you can get your own uh, API key using the form, or you can just use this demo key that they provide. But it is pretty clear that you just fill in this form. And um, I want to say it was instantaneous. I don't think that there was any uh, human involvement in this form. Um, it, they, they gather the data and they'll look at it later, maybe, but um, immediately you will get a key if you fill this out. Uh, versus if we go back to uh, Google Calendar, um, so it's gonna tell us, this is the overview. And uh, if we go to their overview, they send us to a page and actually I'm not gonna let that load because I can't remember what you can see when it first loads. Uh, I should have uh, logged that before, but you need to go to a page within their site to set up your um, OAuth, which again, I'll go into next week, all the details about that. And I'll know for sure what I can, can and can't load and probably make some screenshots. Um, and, but so there's a whole like other set of things you need to do on the OAuth side of things. Uh, but yeah, so almost always what I do is yeah, I'll look at the documentation. If it's clearly laid out, cool. You can use the documentation. But a lot of times it's buried somewhere and I don't know if I'm searching for API key or am I searching for OAuth or what am I trying to find in the docs? And so I'll look at the uh, open API spec if I have it, use that to figure out what am I looking for? Oh, they use an API key. So now I need to hunt around on their website and find where I can request an API key. Um, all right, did that work? Did that make sense for the how to find it? Like, I know I can't give you a straight up answer but I'm hoping that that's at least getting you on the right path. All right. And so now the last two sections of this chapter, we're gonna do one about authentic candidate and requests using API keys. And then next week we'll do OAuth. And more and more, I do think that the OAuth is probably gonna be its own chapter. Um, and yeah, until you really get into the code, uh, even yeah, in the documentation or anything, it can be hard, but once you've done it a few times, like there are, so I, there aren't standards of how to document it, but there are standards of how to do it. And most of them are at least pretty close to like actually using the standards. And so once you know what you're looking for, um, it should get pretty standard to implement it. Oh, I do have a little, oh, I should probably go back to the right screen so you can see what I'm talking about. So, all right, how can I authenticate a request using API keys? All right, uh, before we do this, before you actually write any code, anything that you're actually working on, if you're putting this in a project uh, or in a package or anything like that, you should use this uh, function, use this git vaccinate. That will um, help you set things up to not accidentally send any of these API keys or other passwords to Git, because once you send them to Git, it's really hard to get rid of them. And basically you have to change them. You have to get make those keys invalidated. 
um, because they will be in your history, um, especially if you send them to GitHub uh, or GitLab or anything like that. So I highly recommend using Git Vaccinate. And then a lot of times you'll also want to specifically ignore uh, any R environment that is in a uh, package. So you might have your global uh, thing set up to not share an R environment, but it's still, if you are telling people to use it, um, which we'll talk about later, um, like don't just count on your global because a different user might set theirs up and then share it into the repo and then there's a big mess. So uh, set that up to be ignored with the dot R environment. Um, Yes, yeah, definitely useful to do. And and I say to use use this, like technically you don't have to use use this for any of this, but uh, use this just makes it easier. So I highly recommend, um, you don't have to remember the syntax and this one uses, uh, you know, does this one use grep to search, grep style searching, or does it use like asterisk wildcard kind of things and all that, eh, use this, I'll deal with it. All right. All right, and the next aside that we need to go over before we can implement this is, I, I talked a couple of times about HTTP request headers. Um, those are just metadata about the request. So the user agent was an example of a request header. Um, and we saw that uh, FEC API accepts a, um, where are you, a, a header. So you can send an API key in the header. So that's another rec header. Um, header two has this function, rec headers, where you send a request and then a named list of things you want to set in the header, set up in the headers, and this dot .redact argument. What this does is, um, well, sorry, I have these laid out. So dot .rec is your request, dot 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 is your name value pairs for the headers. Um, just something that I found useful while going through this is usually, you know, you'll see, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong tab, but you, you know, this has this name is capital X, capital A, capital K, but actually the standard is that these are case insensitive. Um, it, it, like the the way you send the requests usually will actually lowercase everything, I believe. So you don't have to worry about that capitalization. And I thought that was helpful to learn. Um, and then there's this dot redact argument where it's an, a, big, an, a vector of header names that you want to hide when you print things. And so if we look at an example, um, this is one where I set up that rec header with XAPI key equals demo key, just using the default thing and told it to redact that XAPI key. And it just prints as redacted. It's, this isn't actually like actually secure. Um, but it's, it's nice for your history and for anyone looking over your shoulder, because you could be loading this demo key from a, an environment variable which is um, something I don't have in the slides yet, but that is what I would recommend doing. Um, and you know, then no one needs to see that if it's hidden in the environment variable. And that's what this dot redact is for. It's just to make it a little bit harder for you to accidentally share it. If you go digging like this object that you created has the actual key in it, it just doesn't print. Um, oh, and I, yeah, I have the link here because I, um, you know, I'm just using what they said. Now I did use the capitalization here, but that was just because to do this, I just took this and, you know, copy control C and paste it. And so it's not worth changing the capitalization, but it's nice to know that you don't have to actually worry about it. All right. So this is, um, the first point where I got to something where I, I think it is actually useful to introduce. I have a package that I am working on. It's not on CRAN yet, but it should be on CRAN uh, within the next couple of months, probably, uh, called Nectar. Um, it's because uh, Apis is the Latin name for bee, and so it's it's to feed your bees. And so if you're working with APIs, Nectar kind of simplifies some things. And I built a rec auth API key, the missing function from Hitter2, where you can just take it kind of in open API language. So you take a location, a parameter name and the actual value, and it will just write this code for you. It's really all it's doing here. Um, and so it does exactly the same thing. Um, 
you know, in that case, it's not that much harder to write the code, but you have to remember, uh, oh, it's rec headers and I want to set the dot redact and whatever, versus you can just use the location parameter name and API key. All right. Um, I have, I don't, like I have a section on OAuth, but I really don't want to go into it because so, it's not really cooked yet. And so uh, we're going to end there today. Do you have any questions, comments, um, concerns at this point? Make sure I have everything visible. Well, okay. Uh, so like I said, <laughs> I was stressing trying to get the OAuth section done and then realized, oh, right, uh, we said we were going to take two weeks, so I don't have to feel so bad if I don't quite get to this. And OAuth is probably going to be its own chapter. It is a really big um, idea, although it's not like acknowledge that it's com uh, complicated, but don't be afraid of it is what I would say. And hopefully I can get that across next week. And so one more week and we'll be able to interact with pretty much any API. I have All a right. tangential sure. question. Sure, go for it. Um, so based on what you know about OAuth, does that impact how you choose uh, to log into systems <laughs> in terms of allowing Apple oh. to do your Gmail? Oh, um, yes, but I think not the way you're thinking. I don't want to give... Uh, the random API, any information, like OAuth is only giving it a temporary thing saying, yeah, it's okay for you to know that this is John. Um, I would rather let Google or Apple or someone more reputable like that uh, handle all that. And so I really, I prefer using login with, um, because Okay, because all... that's more transient stuff that it's sending. Yeah, they only have that key that is saying, yes, you can know that this is John for now. Now, it does give them access to some level of uh, like uh, acknowledgement, but they it tells you in on those sign on sign in scenes, the uh, sign in screens. You might not always really look at them, but it tells you how much access it has to your account, and usually it just has access to know who you are. Um, and so, yeah, I I, I use those uh, pretty religiously. Right. And why does that feel? Because making a new account. Because Joe Bob's API is much more likely to leak my credentials than Google is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, and so I trust that Google will keep my actual login information safe. A and then if it, you know, if something happens, I can just deauthorize that one site. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I, I spoke kind of big at the beginning saying that we'll set up our own OAuth in Plumber uh, in the second half. I haven't actually done that yet, but I think I think we should be able to do it. And um, in that case, I would not use my random Plumber API to log into other websites. I wouldn't advise people <laughs> to trust that, but it would be possible at, uh, I don't know, we'll see. There might be something that's kind of neat to do at least. Um, but at that point we should like really, really be able to understand, it, uh, how these things work. And even more so, I want to try to figure out how to use Google OAuth to log into my API. And we'll try that in the second half of the book, but I haven't actually done it yet. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. All right. All right. Well, with that, um, I think I will see everyone on Slack. Bye. Thanks, John.